Hello and welcome to the How to Exit podcast, where we introduce you to a world of small to medium business acquisitions and mergers. We interview business owners, industry leaders, authors, mentors, and other influencers with the sole intent to share with you what it looks like to buy or sell a business. Let's get rolling. Hello, and welcome to the How to Exit podcast. Today, I'm here with John Andrews. John is an attorney, or I guess in uh, the UK, you call them solicitors. But uh, here, you're a corporate attorney. You specialize in corporate and commercial law. And uh, it says that your YouTube, I mean, your uh, LinkedIn profile says you offer a practical, proactive, cost-effective advice for businesses of all types, and that you specialize in acquisitions, drafting and reviewing, negotiating uh, commercial agreements. So today, uh, I'm here with you today. Thank you for being here, John. And, uh, you know, thank you for showing up and being on the podcast. No, well, well thanks for inviting me along, Ron. Yeah, so this will be fun. I always want my audience to kind of get to know you. So let's just start right there. Tell us a little bit about kind of how you got started. What made you want to become an attorney? And of all things in the world you could be doing, an attorney that helps in the mergers and acquisitions and corporate contract negotiations. Um, what does that path look like? Yeah, well, it's it, it's not been a, a traditional path, actually, Ron. I uh, b- born and bred in Surrey, um, did my law degree at uh, the London School of Economics, didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. I was half thinking about going into the police force and then um, went to the dark side, as most of my police officer friends would say. Um, started life out as a litigation attorney, as you would say in the States, Decided that that was a young man's game when I got to my mid-30s and then retrained to become a corporate and commercial lawyer in my mid-30s. And I've been doing that for the last 20 years. Awesome. So for the last 30 years, you've, uh, you say 20 or 30? Uh, 20 as a corporate lawyer, 30 years as a, as a lawyer in total. Okay. So for the last 20 years, I'm sure you've seen all kinds of uh, deals and deals that fall apart and stuff like that. So I think we're going to have an interesting conversation. I have some U.S. friends who are interested in buying a London-based uh, company. So, uh, and I know I, I'm not going to solicit legal advice here. So I'm just kind of add generally like, what are the things people should look out for uh, when you know when we're looking at buying companies? You know, in in UK and London. Is there anything yeah. that's like really unique we gotta to uh, be aware of? I think I think the I think the key the key difference between buying in the UK and, and the States, in my experience, is the is the buyer's appetite for for risk. Actually, what what, what you will find when I've when I've acted for American buyers is that um, very often when you're drafting the purchase agreement, you will have uh, warranties, so promises about the business contained in that purchase agreement. Um, and, and I think in the States, it's, it's quite common, if not usual, for, um, for those warranties to be termed in the form of, of being indemnities. So the, so the legal exposure um, for, for, for the seller is greater if those warranties are, are untrue. In the, in the UK, there is a distinct difference between warranties and indemnities, and they're kept very separate. So warranties are not termed as indemnities. Um, and... To put it simply, the, the exposure under warranties tends to be less and they tend to be more difficult to prove. So I think a, a US buyer acquiring businesses in, in the UK will probably need to expect there will be a greater a greater exposure to risk under the terms of the agreement. So one of the things I'm learning, and uh, I have not bought one bought a business in the UK, but uh, I do have friends that are over there. I have friends who, uh, um, you know, we all train under the same mentor guy and he's from that area. So I, I'm connected with quite a few. There's a national database where the financials are kept. Uh, does that help with the due diligence? Uh, I'll, I'll, I didn't want to name it because I'll butcher what it's called. And uh, a, 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 a national database of, of businesses to acquire or information about the businesses. And if the information about the business, the financials, there's a national database where all yeah. all public businesses have to report their financials to. Yeah, absolutely. So, so essentially, all, all limited companies and limited liability partnerships have to file annual accounts. Um, so um, they're filed at company's house. 
that, that there's a formal record kept there of who the directors of the business are, um, who their accountants are, where their registered office is, and they have to file, um, file, file accounts every year. Now, depending on the size of the business, um, that, that will determine how detailed those accounts are. So for, for small businesses, those accounts will be pretty cursory uh, and the information that's available or financial information is quite limited. For bigger businesses, um, generally speaking, we're talking about businesses over, over 5 million turnover. They will have to file audited accounts, which go into a lot more detail. And there's a lot more information available at Company South in, in their filed accounts. I think it, I think that actually uh, would probably help considering like here, one of the things I find often is the small businesses, I would say, uh, anything le- lower than 20, 25 employees, uh, definitely anything less than 10 employees, it's very common for the books to be a real mess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if they have any at all, like, you know, uh, when, when I asked somebody to send their financials over and he's like, you want my bank statements? Like, no, your profit and loss, your, you know, and he's like, uh, it, it, the guy's making 1.5 you know, million a year in revenue. You guys call it turnover. Yeah. And he's got an accountant that does his taxes, but he doesn't have a bookkeeper or accountant that does like profit and loss statements, balance sheets and all that. And I'm like, Ex- exactly. <laughs> you know, part of the acquisition process that we're looking for, quite apart from the filed accounts, we mm-hmm. also want to see the, the, the management accounts on a month to month basis to see what, what's happening. And I think what, what, what I find, uh, what I'm actually for buyers or sellers here, particularly for those smaller businesses um, so um, owner-managed businesses in particular, lots of them are, are run as lifestyle businesses. So they'll, they'll say, well, the, the profit I make is X, um, but out of that, you know, I, I've, I've taken the kids on holiday, I've, I've paid for my extension, and they've all been put through the books. But actually, I'm far more profitable than, than my accounts show. The truth of it is, over here, if you want to maximise the value of the business, you've got to plan probably two or three years in advance if, you, if, you're, if you're running that kind of lifestyle business, stop putting that through the books and show you proved true profit if you want to benefit from what the real profit of that business is. Yeah, we do the same thing here. We want to, uh, we look at the last three years and, uh, you know, we can unwind some of that ourselves just by putting, you know, adding it back in. Yeah. But it's, it's a lot cleaner and a lot of, you know, easier for anybody looking to acquire if you have that straightened out, right? If you spent the last two or three years keeping books that you're working on, gearing it towards the sell, like maximizing what your seller's discretionary earnings is or exactly. in, in a little bit bigger EBITDA and minimizing, you know, personal expenses out of there. So yeah, uh, like so, I, looked, so- I, I looked at a company here locally who the guy has him and his wife bought every year maybe about every 18 months, but usually within that same year, they drive the latest and greatest fancy Land Rovers, right? And their, yeah, lease, exactly. yeah. their leases are in the, in there, you know, so they've got, you know, a couple grand worth of leases for vehicles and then their their personal phones are in there and they're like, well, we just brought our business phones through that. And so we started trying to add some of that back in and, um, you know, there's some other stuff that's in there, like uh, just all of his uh, home entertainment stuff. So yeah. like the cable internet service, the, I mean, it was just all mixed up. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and you're right. It's, it, but it takes a bit of time for you as a buyer to strip that stuff out, out and think, well, actually what, what's the true profitability? You know, I don't mind not doing it because we buy it off of profitability. So if you really don't want the top price for your business, you know, like, and, you, and you're, <laughs> And you're taking in three or four grand a month worth of personal expenses. If you yeah. don't want your three X on that money, you know. <laughs> that, you know. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. right. Here in the United States, when we're looking at buying a business, the whole acquisitions and mergers process, um, it can take, for small, quick deals, it could take weeks. I think I've seen a few done in like really short time frames. Like, like they were really prepared and the negotiations was easy. Or it can take 18 months. Um, does having all the stuff in the public house or whatever that was called there, does that make it go any faster or is there still a kind of a, what's the life cycle of a, you know, I don't know, a sub $10 million acquisition? Okay. So, so, so typically um, w- w- with a, with an acquisition here, whether it's a share purchase or, or an asset purchase, um, you'll, you'll have heads of terms, first of all, which sets out the headline, the headline uh, terms of the deal. So price, 
Are there going to be personal guarantees, any deferred consideration, those sorts of things. So the headline terms. Um, you'll then move pretty quickly from there to uh, the buyer's solicitor sending out uh, an information request, a due diligence request asking information about the business. Um, we'll, set, we'll set up a data room. The seller will answer that information request, upload data to the data room with those answers. Um, once we've got that information, we can do our uh, investigations. We can do a report to the client. And around that stage, we will start drafting the, the acquisition agreement. Um, typically, that takes two or three turns before it's in, a, in an agreed form. It goes backwards and forwards between attorneys. Um, we, we then have the ancillary agreements that we have to draft. So, you know, uh, resignations of directors, appointment of directors, all those sorts of things. Um, and then all, all else being equal, we'll proceed to completion. So. Um, a typical a typical deal in a comfortable time frame will take probably eight to twelve weeks in, in the UK. You, you can do it quicker. Um, uh, generally speaking, if you want to do it much quicker than that, you're you're compromising on due diligence. Um, the, the, the biggest issue in the UK, biggest delay to deals, is usually the property side, um, particularly if you're doing an asset purchase. If you're doing a share purchase and the properties are owned by the limited companies that you're buying, then you don't need to do a separate assignment or transfer of those properties because they come across as part of the company's assets. If you're doing an asset purchase, so you are acquiring the business off of a limited company, but not buying the shares in it itself, um, then you need a separate um, transfer process. And in the UK, that's still quite antiquated quite paper-based, um, you have to go, if it's a leasehold property, you have to get the landlord's permission to transfer the lease and all of those things take time. So if it's a share purchase with um, the property registered to the company and you're prepared to compromise a little on the DD process, you, you, you can cut that down to you know four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. Just for a, like, we do have a lot of listeners who just they're running businesses and they're considering buying another business. So they're not what I would consider formally trained in this process. That what he was referring to right now is the difference between buying the company, the entity itself, a share purchase, you're buying shares in the company, or setting up your own company, what we call a special purpose, purpose vehicle, an SPV, and buying just the assets of the business. So every chair, every computer, pretty much every thing gets a, a line item, a price, an invoice, and gets you're, you're transferring all the assets, including the brand names, the intellectual property. They all gets transferred over. With the hopes, and I say hopes because it's not always true, right? Yeah. He's not in his head. It's the hopes that you're minimizing the liability. You're not you're not buying their history. When you buy a company and all of its shares, technically you're buying kind of the history. So if they've done something wrong that hasn't shown up in the court system yet, you're going to get to deal with that. I would venture to say even in, a, uh, in an asset purchase, you're still going to need to deal with it. You probably just have a better argument when, at least here in the United States, um, you're still going to need to deal with it if they did something wrong and they go to suing because you have all the assets that, you know, and the business. But you're, yeah. I think you got a better leg to stand on when you're in court to go, look, I didn't buy the... the yeah, I, I think that's right. In the UK, it's, it's a little bit more cut and dried. So um, the biggest risk in the UK with buying uh, the shares in, in an industry company, as you say, you're, you're buying its history. You're taking it on as a going concern. Um, the downside of that is there might be undisclosed litigation or complaints. Uh, also, tax uh, revenue issues are often cause, cause uh, problems when you buy companies. Um, the upside to it is the process can be a little bit more seamless because there's no transfer of property. Also, if the business that you're acquiring has a number of long-term contracts with clients, there's no change in the entity that's supplying that service. It's still the same company. So you don't have to go to the client and ask for their agreement for the contract to be transferred across because there is no, no change in the parties that have entered into that contract. Um, with an asset purchase here, um, commonly our agreements exclude liability for everything that took place uh, prior to the acquisition. We're saying, we're saying that we're leaving all of the liabilities and history with the selling company. We're just taking the assets. The exception to that 
uh, in the UK is uh, employee liabilities. So if there were issues with the employees prior to transfer, those employees transfer across to your new SPV on the same terms and conditions. You can't change them. You can't harmonise them with your other employees. Um, and if they had, if they were underpaid, if they were discriminated against, the liabilities for those claims pass across to you, even though you've done an asset purchase. So what you then have to do is to protect your position by getting appropriate warranties and indemnities in, in the asset purchase agreement from the seller. Is there an insurance product that actually would protect you against something like that? Uh, generally speaking, no. And, and if you can get it insured, it's, it's hugely expensive. What, what you tend to do is do quite a lot of, on asset purchases, is do quite a lot of detailed due diligence. And if you have any concerns, um, you either ensure that you have a, a decent element of deferred consideration, so you hold back part of the purchase price, you know, for a period of time or pay it over a period of times, or you have a specific retention, which you hold in a bank account, which we call an escrow account for a period of time to make sure that any potential claims don't materialize. Generally speaking, most of these claims have to be bought within three to six months if they're employment claims. So you try and hold back a sum of money for at least that period of time if you identify an issue in your due diligence. I, I would imagine that having done this for the last 20 years and stuff, you've got a pretty good sampling of like what works and what doesn't. What would you say is the biggest thing that kills the deal from the seller side? A seller's trying to sell his business. You guys are helping them, you know, get the paperwork done. What What's the biggest thing that can prop up that would, you know, yeah. stop that process, the forward progress on that? I, I think the, the, the big issues are, as I say, first of all, not being honest in your accounts or in the financial information that you provide at the outset. Um, secondly, having unrealistic expectations as to, as to what the multiple is that you can achieve for your business in your particular sector. And as you probably know, Ron, if you've done a few acquisitions, different sectors have different multiples. So some might be three times, some might be five, some might be seven. Um, but generally speaking, buy, buyers... Buyers are not unreasonable in terms of multiples, but they know what multiples apply in particular sectors. So it, it, in most of the deals that I have that fall down, it tends to be unrealistic expectations from the from the seller's part on, on, on what they're going to get for their, what they can hope to achieve for their business. And that's why the, the head to term stage is pretty important, because if you can agree the headline figure there and, and all of the key terms, Generally speaking, you're, you're, you're going to be okay. It's when it's when they've not been truthful in the financial information that they've handed over or selective in what they hand over. So I always blame the brokers on that. So the, uh, I always tell the story of the, you know, a seller, you know, guy owns a manufacturing plant. He's getting towards retirement uh, you know, time. He decides he wants to sell. So he calls up his friends and tells them he's going to sell. And they go, hey, I got this buddy. He's a broker. So he calls broker number one and broker says, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. well, how much do you want for your business? And the guy's like, well, a million dollars. And it's really only worth 700K. But the, the guy says, I can probably get you a million. So he's like, you know, I better get a second opinion. So he goes to the next broker and the broker, and he says, well, you know, what do you want? Well, he goes, the last broker said he can get me a million. He goes, well, I'll look at it, but I'm pretty sure I can get you 1.25. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah. by the time they get the broker number three, it's 1.5. And then they go out with that expectation in the market. Nobody will give it. It's only worth 700K on its best best day. And, you know, the deal never gets done. That's That happens a lot here. I think yeah. it's a scary statistics here in the United States. I want to say it's in the 80, 80 something percent of all businesses listed by brokers never sell. Yeah. And I would imagine, you know, in true economics, if it was priced right, somebody would buy it. Right. I, you know, I, I, I think that's exactly right. And I think if you have a, if you have a business where you've got a willing purchaser, say, well, look, if, if that's what you think your business is worth, this is how it's going to perform. Okay, put your money where your mouth is. So the way to do it is, is to, there is a way to structure those deals to say, yeah. well, if it, if it turns out to be as good as that, then what we'll do is we'll pay you a bit up front. We'll pay you a bit after one year, year two, year three. And those deals at the moment in, in the UK are really common. I think since we've had, through, through lockdown and COVID, there have been lots of um, small business owners that have said, right, we've survived that period. Um, now's the time to go. I, I don't want to go through that again. And I think, I don't think it's the same in the States, but we've seen this cycle before. So 2002, 2007, 2008, when we had the crash, uh, the economic crash, 
same thing again. M and A lawyers became really busy because lots of small business owners decided don't want to take the risk again. Now's the time to cash in, and it's those smaller businesses where I think that buyers and sellers have to be a little bit more creative about how they structure their their deals and and how the price is paid. I often, you know, somebody if somebody gets on the phone with me, and I I talked to a few this week and. Um, I put fillers out all the time because I'm always looking. But when a seller says, yeah, I want 1.5 million or whatever the number is, I, you know, before we get to any due diligence, I haven't even seen their books. When they tell me what they want, my natural response is great. Let's see how we can get you there. You yeah, know, that, that, that's a perfect buyer. That is right. a perfect buyer. You know, and it's rarely we can't get there. The last guy is like, great, stay on for three years, double your revenue, and then we'll be there because you know that's what the numbers work out to. You know, yeah. And I'll even come on and help, right? I'll take a minority stake now. I'll come on. We'll help you get to that level. And when we get there, you know, we'll we'll either sell it together to somebody else or I'll buy you out. Yeah. And um, well, it's, it's, it's interesting you say that, Ron. I did a um, I took part in a podcast during the summer with a guy called James Khan, who's um, one of the Dragon Stand guys. Yeah. And listening to him speak was really interesting because he he rarely buys 100% of, of any business. His his whole ethos of acquiring business is leave, leave the seller with, with a stake because they've got an incentive to grow it. And, and, and that's worked well for him. Yeah, I think it's a, it's great too when you have, especially when you have multi-generational businesses, right? Uh, if you got a business that's been around for three generations, there's going to be a set of those customers who want to talk to, like if it's the Smith family foundry or whatever it is, they're going to want to talk to Mr. Smith. Exactly. And by keeping him around, even at a minority stakeholder, like at 20% or so, I, I'm very, very fond of that method myself. Let's keep them on. Let's do something. Uh, and, you know, they have a vested stake in, you know, making sure yeah. that anybody that insists upon talking to family or, you know, uh, you know, helping having one of those guys, you know, do that they're on retainer. They can come, you know, they own a piece of the business. They have a vested interest in coming back to help with stuff like that. Yeah. And, and also I think with those family run businesses, I think a lot of the employees quite like to have that feeling of, of continuity, at least for a period of time. We talked about the seller side, like what does the, the seller need to bring to the table? That's, you know, uh, and your experiences that, you know, the right pricing kills yeah. a lot of the deals uh, from the buyer's side, you know, what ticks the seller off where they just won't do business with a buyer? Uh, you know, having done this as long as you have, I'm sure you've seen that a lot. Yeah, I can, well, I can tell them the, the most common thing is where you've got, um, say, an, an inexperienced buyer or a new buyer, no track record. Um, they they want to put, they want to buy the business on deferred payment terms. So they don't want to pay too much down, but they also don't want to give any personal guarantees or assurances that the seller's going to get their price. That, that's, that, that's the biggest issue. So uh, again, there's lots of these deals happening in the UK at the moment where it's not uncommon for no payments to be made up front. So lots of the businesses that are being sold at the moment have got retained profits, so cash in the business. So the sellers are thinking, well, we've got half a million pounds sitting in our bank account. If we take that out as dividend or as, or as salary, we're going to pay tax at not far short of 50% in the UK on that at the moment. Whereas if they sell, if they sell their shares in the business, sell their limited company, um, and that half a million pounds is lent to the buyer. So essentially the buyer uses that the cash is left in the business. The buyer uses those retained profits to fund the upfront payment. Um, the sellers get that half a million pounds out at ten percent tax rather than fifty. So that on its own is worth worth a big chunk to them. So lots of deals are being done where the buyers are putting none of their own money in. They're using cash in the business to pay the upfront payment, and then the balance is deferred over over a period of time. So the business self funds the purchase, if that makes sense. Now. That works well, but what you've got is the seller saying, well, if I'm not going to get the rest of my money for another two years or three years, what if things go wrong in that period of time? Well, I want an assurance that I'm going to get that. And the best assurance you can have is a personal guarantee from the, from the buyer. Um, most buyers don't want to give that. And if I'm acting for a buyer, we try and work around it. But um, I, I think realistically, if, if you are a buyer that's looking to buy on those sorts of terms, you've got to be prepared to at least assume some risk in the deal. 
um, you know, there are quite a few of the mentors out there. If people want to learn this, they're teaching that dollar down, no money down deal. And, and it doesn't mean that the seller doesn't get money at the closing. It just means it's not coming from you. Right. Yeah, so it yeah. could be from a third party source, like a private investor, or it could be from cash on hand. Uh, I would stray to say that if, if you don't have if you're looking at buying a business out there and you don't have a war chest of some cash to put back in that, you better figure out what uh, normal operating expenses are and mandate that there's a certain <laughs> amount of normal operating cash left in the bank. <laughs> I, 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 absolutely. So, so what we do quite commonly here is that the way we structure deals is that we have a what we call a, a target working capital figure. So we want to know what cash the business needs to be cash flow for the next month or two. We, 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 we'll, we want that cash left behind, and then everything over that can go out to the go out. So what you don't want to do is buy a business that actually has got a load of debt on day one with no cash to finance it. Right. So I always throw that stuff in there. We. We're in this space. I mean, I, I spend every day in it now. Uh, you've done this for 20 something years. Uh, a lot of things you and I just look at and go, okay, it's normal. A lot of the listeners who uh, want to do what they call here is aqua hire, where they're uh, growing through acquisition or they're trying to buy their first business because they come right out of college and they want to buy. Uh, there's a lot of news articles and, and uh, conversations right now out in the public as instead of building, you know, building a business, you should just buy one. Yeah. So, uh, uh, occasionally I'm going to jump back into the weeds of things so that, uh, we make sure we, uh, don't leave some people behind there. <laughs> yeah. So I always, um, I, I love these conversations because I learn along the way too. Um, what would be the best resources if somebody was looking to buy a business in the UK? I know here we have some websites up and some stuff like that. Uh, can somebody actually search that uh, that that database of businesses out there? You can you, you can. There's a number of different databases that you can search to get to find out details of businesses in the sector. Actually, find out finding out details of businesses for sales is, is, is a lot more difficult. Generally speaking, it, right. it's it's the brokers who have those, and you need to go to the brokers' websites. Of course, if you're a buyer. It's no skin of your nose because you're not you're not paying the broker. It's the seller who's doing it. Yeah. Um, that, that what what again? What's very common in the UK is people are buying databases of businesses in the sector they want to acquire, and then literally just firing out emails, posting letters, saying, "Look, I'm in the market. Do do you want to sell your business?" Um, and again, at, at the at the lower end of the market in terms of value. Lots of people think their business is, isn't saleable, and they suddenly get a letter or an email saying, "Look, I want I want to buy your I want to buy your hairdressing business, your beauticians, because I'm trying to build a chain of them." Um, and very often, there's deals to be done. So people who wouldn't ordinarily think about selling, thinking they're going to run it and then retire and close it, will suddenly be open to a, to an offer. Here, there's a huge aging population of the baby boomers who are still working, still own their own business. And they're in their high, I want to say they're in their high 60s, approaching their 70s now. And they're in that same boat. They just, they either don't, don't know how to sell it. There's no succession plan whatsoever. Yeah. Right? And um, I think that's what's um, driving the push to get into this space. There's a lot of uh, guys out teaching how to do this. Um, you know, the Jeremy Harbors of the world, the Roland Frazier's, the uh, Carl Allen's, all those guys. Yeah. All, I've studied under some of them myself just because, um, you know, if I pick up one skill to, to, to sharpen the to sharpen the blade on the, you know, in the tool set here, then that makes an enormous difference. So w what concerns, you know, me is when you get a lot of new people into things, um, especially the guys coming out of the real estate space where it's kind of what is residential real estate space in the United States is a little bit wild, wild west. Yeah. If they go do what they've done in the commercial real estate space, which is blanketly throw offers out all over the place and then only talk to the people that accept them and negotiate it, it's a different world inside of, at least in the U.S., there's a failure, there's an element on commercial contracts, which is a failure, failure to perform that doesn't exist in the residential real estate space. Yeah. So, you know, I met a young guy here who uh, he's like, you know, I just I just started sending letters of intent to every company I like I, I run their math. I know where they're supposed to be. I send a letter of intent to them 
Uh, and I was like, yeah, I need to have a few conversations before you get there. And he didn't yeah. get that there's, you know, I, I know that letters of intent are non-binding, but my fear is if he's willing to jump that far forward, he's going to get himself in a situation where there's some type of implied contract or, you know, there's a lot of stuff that exists on the commercial space that doesn't exist in that residential um, buying a home space. Yeah. What are your concerns I, are, go ahead. I, I'd, I'd agree with that. I think um, in the UK, in terms of actually putting a price forward, so I think that's pretty rare. What 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 this re- what these letters really are are just a, a feeder to see whether there there's somebody who wants to sell. I think the danger of looking at accounts at Companies House, for example, as as I, as I mentioned to you, um, is that you make an offer and that might be wildly over the top, and suddenly you 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 then meet the guys in person, you get hold of some management information, management accounts. You think, well, do you know what? That bears no relation to the to the, the figures that have been filed. Um, and then you're in the situation of going back to that seller and saying, well, actually, I'm going to offer you a, a quarter of a, or a half of what I first mentioned. And that, that gets you off on a bad foot anyway. So I think if you were going to adopt this tactic of so a, a scattergun approach of firing out these letters, stay away from mentioning figures and just say, look, I, I, I'm a buyer interested in buying in your market. I think I wouldn't go much further than that. I agree. I can see it getting them in trouble. And, and they do it here on the residential side. They just, they jump on to whatever databases are out there. They run their numbers and they just start submitting offers all over the place. And they only negotiate on contracts that come back. And I was like, if you did that in this commercial space, you could get nailed for failure to perform. I've seen people get sued over on commercial real estate uh, yeah. because they agreed to a contract and then, you know, the other guy signed it and then they found something they wanted to negotiate down. And it's, You've already signed a contract. It's a different. Well, well, it's a different game. It's it's, it's it's an interesting point actually because I, I guess if you send out a letter saying that I've seen your business, I want to buy it, and this is what I'll offer for it, and somebody fires back a letter saying yes, deal done, <laughs> you could be in trouble. You know, uh, you know, <clears throat> I I don't think it'll get that bad. It's like one of the reasons I jumped out of the real estate space is uh, I don't remember. I'm going to butcher who actually made the quote, but. There was a quote about the stock market. Is when, about when the when a shoe side boy starts giving you advice on on stocks, you probably shouldn't be in the stock market, right? You know, <laughs> in, in the United States, the real estate space was getting that way. You know, yeah. I had people just like barely, you know, that just graduated high school calling, you know, calling me trying to wholesale me houses, and he's got fifteen houses under contract, and none of them yeah. are priced right, right? And uh, he's not going to be able to sell any of them. Basically, whatever the seller said they wanted, he said yes. And then he tried to sell those contracts, you know, to investors like myself. And yeah. I just knew by looking at that, that eventually it's going to turn bad. And yeah. just last November, they passed a law here in this state that says you have to have a real estate license to actually wholesale contracts like that. Right. So that's what happens. And the same thing's going to happen in, you know, in this commercial acquisition or business acquisition space. You get a yeah. bunch of new, new guys in here that don't know what they're doing and they start harming business owners. Then we're absolutely going to have new, you know, listen, in the United States, we regulate everything. Uh, you're going to have new regulations that make it harder for the rest of us. So, you know, yeah. it's interesting that um, um, seeing a lot more. I mean, I've only been like full time doing this for about the last two years. Um, and uh, in that two years, I've seen uh, new gurus pop up. I've seen, you know, new courses going out, uh, some really intelligent people getting into the space. But I've also yeah. seen a lot of, uh, people come into these courses and never owned a business, n- never had anything other than a job, but they just paid 10 grand to learn how to buy and sell businesses. And they think that's what they're going to do. So, well, I, I tell you what, I, I'm coming across that fairly, fairly regularly. And, um, what you will, what you find is there's, there's lots of inexperienced purchasers. Um, we, we, we had one the other day where there was such a disconnect between, what the what the purchaser thought he'd agreed with the sellers and what the sellers wanted for their business and we couldn't even get to heads of terms you know it was one phone call it became blatant that the deal was never going to get off the ground ever right so if somebody were going to get into this space and uh you know in your market what would you suggest their process be like if they were going to go buy a business um go ahead yeah, I, I, I think I think the, the, the first part of it is this: is ideally buy buy a business in a sector that you know something about. I think that you know I've got people at the moment who who are looking to acquire businesses, for example, in, in the care home sector, 
residential care. Now, that's highly regulated, highly specialised. Um, so if you haven't got experience in that, in that area, um, and, unless you're looking to buy a business that's got an established and maintainable management team in place already, it, it's not the kind of sector you should be looking at. So, so I think the first rule is buy something that, that you know a bit, a bit about. So you might have been a manager in a business or, or worked in that business for a period of time, and that's the ideal sector you should then be looking to, to acquire in. I think, I think secondly, be realistic about the finances of it. What, 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 can you, what can you afford to do? What's your appetite for risk in doing these deals? And, and, and what do you stand to lose if they go wrong? I think those, those two tenants uh, are key when you start out on this journey, really. It's interesting you say that. Um, I was looking at a business, I guess it was this week. I'm still looking at it. It's a, a furniture, commercial furniture. And uh, if the uh, seller happens to listen to this, hi, I'm still looking. I'm still interested. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the, the interesting thing was is, I just figured, you know, it's commercial, it's, uh, it's commercial furniture, it's uh, office, uh, conference tables, desks, chair, partitions, uh, and that type of stuff, right? It's uh, a, a full line, and, and, and it's a decent business, doing two and a half million in turnover. What yeah. I, so I just figured, oh, it's just sell, it's a showroom in sales, right? And, yeah. uh, but I happen to know some people in that space, so I started calling some of my friends that have been doing this for 25, 30 years. Like, no, this is a very unique space. Uh, it's not just like you just don't jump in this and learn selling furniture overnight. Yeah. You can't pull somebody off the street. There's a lot of like, you know, I guess designer work to design the layouts of the stuff. And there's just this, you know, the whole point I'm making here is sometimes something looks really simple at the superficial level, the high level, and you yeah. start diving into it. And there's a lot of corporate knowledge that goes along with almost any any industry right um i i i think that's right so so taking the example you've just given i'm guessing you need to know a bit about space planning for example um health and safety issues yeah. you know, all, all those kinds of things that actually are, are on the face of it you think yeah. this should be a straightforward business but yeah i i, I get that and that, that just reinforces i think what my yeah. what is one of the reps was telling me there's certain materials on certain one of these certain furnitures and stuff that are not allowed in certain states and not because of fire codes and and hazard stuff. So like there's just a lot to learn, you know, in any yeah. of these spaces. And then, you know, I'm thinking, hey, you just buy an office furniture that, you know, the sales cycle has got to be 60 or 90 days. And she's like, no, you know, she's <laughs> like telling me that one of her client, you know, that's very often that, you know, for large uh, moves and large furnishings of big corporate moves it's 12 to 18 month sell cycle for it's some of these. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. So, not, yeah. you know, I would have never thought, right. I was just like, Oh, I'm leasing this space. I need, I need, you know, desk for a hundred employees, make it happen. Cause I'm the ready, you know, ready, you know, ready fire aim guy. Right. I, I just, I, I really just jump in and, you know, uh, I have two mottos, ready fire aim and lead follower, get the hell out of my way. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so to, to say that, okay, you got a plan for 12 to 18 months to move 150 employees. And yeah. everything has to be right. Yeah. So uh, I started looking at it and it's like, okay, there's only six employees there and nobody's ready to be the general manager that the, the, the owner's wanting to, to step off and do something else. Yeah. I need 10 plus employees in most companies to actually have enough of a team to where I, usually there's somebody there that can run it better than you. Yeah. Right. And, 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 you know, at, at the end of the day, doing what you do wrong you don't want to be there on a day-to-day -day basis dealing with the dealing with the nitty-gritty. So yeah, so so I'd say you know there are some people who are serial entrepreneurs, you know, like yourself and buy in different sectors. But generally speaking, when you're doing that, you're you're, you're acquiring businesses that, that have got a team in there that that know that business are stable, will stay there and, and run it for you. One of the other options is uh, there was one, unfortunately, the, they had a huge IRS problem. I always bring it up. So everybody that's on the podcast heard this one a million times probably. But there's a concrete plant we were looking at. And unfortunately, they had a nearly million dollar uh, IRS issue. But um, and they said we couldn't take it over. But, you know, they were third generation. They both, uh, the two main uh, leaders in this wanted to leave. And the first thing I did is I found, and they weren't really well run, meaning they were at that 10 to depending on what year between 10 and 13 million revenue turnover uh yeah. what you call turnover we call revenue uh here when we say turnover i, was, I always rephrase that because here turnover is losing employees 
Uh, <laughs> right, yeah. Your turnover is like, you know, employees are climbing and going. So it's, uh, it's the, it's, you're not keeping employees very well or your yeah. customers are leaving. So, but, uh, the revenue is between 10 and 12 million. The first thing I did, and they were profiting, like, I want to say like on a good year, 50 to a hundred thousand, like they were just eating every bit of cash they can get their hands on. So the first thing I did is found a smaller one nearby that was in the same market space, selling almost the same product line that was run at a 28% profit margin and really well managed. It was for sale. So the goal was buy them both and let the one that manages, you know, the, the team really well manage mm -hmm. both sites. They're 40 miles away. So there is a, a way around like turning a company around without having to be the turn turnaround specialist. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, in my world, it's building teams and, and uh, executing uh, based off of teamwork. Uh, if you're a solo guy wanting to buy something, I would totally agree with you. You better buy something you really know or yeah. be humble enough to know that you better, you know, that the company needs to afford the right people. So yeah. if you can't be the general manager because you don't know the industry, do the do the salary evaluation and figure out what is a top notch industry general manager in that industry make and make sure your acquisitions and your buying your finances that business can afford that guy because it needs it I, I, th I think you're right and, and, and when you're doing your sums you need to look at what what costs you've stripped out for, for, from the seller so you know the seller's dividends that, that their salary that they're taking that their benefits and, and and make some allowance within that not, not think to yourself i've cut that cost that's that's bottom line profit do I need to reinvest that somewhere else? Like you're saying, a good general manager in, in right. new IT, you know, in you know, Google searches, all those sorts of things. I often find that the seller's not paying themselves enough for me to replace them. <laughs> oh, well, right. yeah, well, yeah, there is that. Exactly right. Yeah. Nobody that does, you know, it's funny is there's a pest control company here. I own a small pest control here. Um, I, I, I bought it to help employ some, some relatives I really like, and I bought it too small. So a lesson learned, don't ever buy yourself another job. And I did, but, uh, I'm looking for other ones. If you've got one out there, I'd be interested in it. But, uh, the, uh, inside of that, when you buy something like super small, it, it's going to eat up your calendar time, right? That company, yeah. that, that the pest control company, it doesn't make the revenue to justify even a full-time person answering the phone. So when yeah. my techs can't answer the phone, it routes to me, right? Yeah. And I've got other things I should be doing with my time. So that's uh, just, if you're out there, you're out there looking at businesses, um, understand what you're buying in the, in the, not just the, can the business run itself with the team that's got there, but like what, what hours you need what what hours do they need of you right yeah so and you're saying you know you probably don't want to spend a lot of time that that furniture company is almost 600 miles from here you're right i don't want to spend a lot of time at that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um i don't know where we're going with that with him uh we'll, we'll we'll see um jumping back to like you know the uk london um you guys are you out of lockdown now Things starting to move uh, around a little we, bit. Yeah, we, we, we're fully, officially, fully out of lockdown. I think this this Thursday, actually. Yeah. Okay. So, so masks, masks are going. Um, yeah. So the companies that are out there now who have survived, who are thinking, man, I don't want to go through that again, and, and are looking to sell. What is their like? Here we have three or four key sites: business or bizbysell.com and some other. And I'm not plugging those guys; they're not sponsors or anything. But um, there's some sites and some tools you can go to LoopNet commercial real estate has a section for businesses for sale. Um, are those active there also, or are there other websites that, you know, people would uh, go look for business for sale? No, and I, 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 I think the States is, is, is very different. The, the, those sorts of sites here are, are rare. Actually. Okay. I think they're far more, far more common in the States. Okay. The, 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 that's why you'll find that this, um, tactic of buying databases and firing out the letters is, is far more common yeah and i'm a copywriter by previous training my master's degree is in marketing and i studied under dan kennedy <laughs> i have an entire shelf so i know that you know in order to, to to get one of those companies to respond the average uh direct mail response is one to two percent so for every hundred oh, letters you're so, dead right about that. You're dead right about that. So there, there, there are some guys I know, you know, might send out 5,000 letters. Yep. If, they, if they get, you know, 10, 10 responses, that they're, they're happy. But yep. as they say, it only takes one or two good ones out of those and then they're, uh, and then they're away. 
Yeah, I didn't want anybody hearing this going, well, I sent 40 letters last week and it don't work. I was like, yeah, do that about six more times and see what you get, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you're, if you're not willing to send at least 250 to 1,000, you probably need to find another marketing mechanism. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, yeah. you're absolutely right. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bulk mail exercise is what it is. Yeah. That's a, I built my real estate uh, business off of it. I had a real estate business and uh, we, we stopped foreclosures back when it was really bad here. And uh, we just tracked everybody that was in that, you know, in the foreclosure process in our market and they got a series of letters from us. So, uh, but on a given month, we probably spent two grand or more on mail. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting you say that I've got, um, just personally, I've got a property portfolio with some of my old law partners, even at my old firms. And we, we, we had less than a year or two ago for somebody looking to buy it and we weren't interested in selling. Um, we are now, we've gone back to that person. So even if you don't get an instant response, yeah. Yeah, it sticks in your mind if you get something like that. That's a, that's a great point. Um, one of the things you'll find also in selling the letters to these business owners is um, they'll hold on to that letter. They'll stick it in a filing cabinet or put it in a drawer or leave it on top of their desk. And everything changes. I always say that everything changes with time and circumstances. Yeah. So if the timing's right and they've just had it, you know, sometimes you'll catch them and they just had a really rough week and they're just done. You'll get that call. And then you're like, um, we I were working on, we were working on a huge roll up here and I can't, because of some legal issues, I'm not going to say what it was or anything, but, um, we were working on a huge roll up and one of the members of that roll up were got on the call and like, Hey, you know, we've been doing this roll up now for nine months. I got a, I just got a call from a, a letter I sent out before this. Right. So, um, that's another thing is consistency. If you're going to do the direct mail campaign, just keep sending it out and you'll yeah. learn that, you know, a week from now, a year from now, you know, somebody's an holding on that letter and calling you and see if you're still interested. So. Oh, I think, I think, I think that's, I think that's absolutely right. So one of my things I always like to ask, uh, we're at about 45, 50 minutes now, 47 minutes or something, I think, um, is, you know, out of all the stuff I asked, you know, those, we've, we've had some pretty good conversations, but what is something I should have asked? Like, where am I, am I missing? There's, there's got to be a great, like, and he really should just ask me this because we really need to talk about that in the acquisitions and merger space. Well, so so in terms in terms of the the UK sector or, or yeah. just generally, uh, if you can add value to either one, I'm I'm all ears. Let's hear it. So. Yeah, well, that, 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 that's 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 a really interesting question. You put me on the spot there, Rob. So I, I, I guess I would say, what would I say? Um, I, I think that. I think the, what I would say to you is this, is that in terms of, in terms of acquiring a business, no business is ever going to be perfect. But, but, but the real key, I think, in, in acquiring a business is making sure, obviously, you've got a good M&A lawyer, but, but as important, if not more important, make sure you've got a good understanding of, of financial figures and have a good account on board. Because if, if, if you get the figures right and you look at the accounts properly and, and you're happy with the underlying supporting documentation, post-deal, it's, it's always the accounts, tax, debt, cash flow that become issues. So if you've, if you've checked the finances out as, as the first step in, in your acquisition process and they stack up, then I think that you're gonna you're gonna find that the, that the deals you undertake, generally speaking, are gonna are gonna make you more likely to make you happy than not. Yeah, and I I agree with that. And you know, for somebody like myself, I've you know I've had accounting in both my undergrad and my grad degree, but I'm no accountant by any means. Yeah. So I I know enough to look through and like if I see something really awkward, but I also know enough to if I see something like that, I have somebody else look at it. Uh, yeah. Here in the United States, if you're going to do something like what they call an LBO, leverage buyout, if you're going to use a, a small business uh, administration loan, the a lot of people say the bank will do the due diligence for you. Do, I, I would say don't don't trust that. I mean, they're going right. to protect their own money. But yeah, I uh, what I what I particularly do is I, I build teams. So I always have an accountant on the team or somebody else that can. That's what they do, right? They're they're, they're either are a CPA or they're yeah. what I refer to as a recovering CPA, <laughs> meaning they were one and they don't want to be one anymore. They've got the credentials for it, but they don't want to. That's not their forty hour a week job. Yeah, and I have them go through everything and show me. You know, show me any red flag. Show me anything I should be concerned about. And yeah. um, you know, and, and I, 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 I think that's crucial. I, I think the other piece of advice is, is that don't use an M and A lawyer. This is not me selling my services. Basically, 
we do these deals day in, day out. Lots of other attorneys and lawyers may dabble in it, but generally speaking, we know where the pitfalls are. We know what we're looking for. And often you'll find that we, we, we can deal with the deals quicker and probably more cost effectively because we, we know what the parameters are. We know what points to take, what points not to take. So I think have, having a good having a good team on board that it's experienced m a work both from an accountancy and legal point of view is is, is a must if you're going to go into this field i yeah i get i can see that the um when you're when you're doing that the, the you know finding the attorney um one of the one of the reasons i would push i'm trying to formulate a thought here i'm like kind of spinning here um the legal due diligence, right? It's there's an acquired skill to that. So your MA attorneys are going to be able to know what databases to search. Uh, I actually had a local attorney do a little bit of due diligence for me, and I found stuff they didn't find, right? Yeah. Uh, they were just this was just a you know a trust attorney, a friend. Uh, I was looking at a, a particular company, and he wanted to get in, into this space. I said, cool, you know, do the legal due diligence for me, see if there's any lawsuits, anything pending. And uh, he's totally skipped over finding what we call UCC liens, which are <laughs> really important. <laughs> um, right. So, yeah, I would I would say find somebody who is specialized in the mergers and acquisitions space. There yeah. is a fine art to really understanding legal liabilities and where those things are tucked in and hidden. Right. So here yeah. in the United States, every court system is independent. So every county. Uh, so you have both state level, county level and federal level, and somebody could be tied up in a local, uh, you know, state level court on a lawsuit that's expensive. And yeah. it may not even be the state they're primary operating in. It might be one of their branches and stuff. And you'll miss out. You'll, you're going to you can get a hold of something that has a heck of a liability. Yeah. Now, there's disclosures inside of these contracts that say if you don't disclose any legal liabilities or, you know, but that doesn't save your time or energy or potential risk. Uh, it's, it's all well and good having it in the contract. The truth is, if you've got to sue on those provisions, it's expensive. It's time consuming. And that's that's not why you're buying the business. You want to buy it and trade it. Yeah, there's uh, it's it's rarely profitable to have to take somebody to court over a mistake like that. It's you're yeah. rarely going to get the money back out of it. Exactly. So. Well, it's uh, it's we're we're at the top of the hour now, and uh, you know, uh, I think we've covered some really cool topics. I want to thank you for being on the show. If people want to contact you, is it okay if I show them your email address? That's what you absolutely. Gave me. Please, please feel free to do that. that that'll be great, Rob. Yeah. Can you verify that for me? Is that the correct one? Uh, that's the one. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Or or they can find me through LinkedIn as well, whichever okay. is easy. Okay. So uh, for the guys who are not on video, it is John Andrews at J mw.co.uk and i'll put that in the show notes um uh you know what we usually don't put text in the show notes like this because the spam scrapers will grab it and, and take it out it's on the screen right now and yeah. uh, if you're listening i'll repeat it one more time it's john andrews it's spelled j-o-h-n-a-n-d-r-e-w-s at jmw.co.uk and uh, that's his email address. If you want to reach out to him, you're thinking about buying a business in London and uh, ha having him as a great resource. Uh, we appreciate having you on the show. If you'll hang out for a few seconds afterwards, you and I can chat and uh, we'll call it a day. Great. Thanks very much, Rob. All right. The Investors and Entrepreneurs Professional Mastermind. The Investors and Entrepreneurial Professional Mastermind combines the traditional peer-to-peer -peer mastermind introduced first in Napoleon Hill's famous book, Think and Grow Rich, with accountability partnering where your peers help you ensure that you set goals, take actions, and get results. If you want to scale, blow past roadblocks, and achieve success faster than you might think is possible, I suggest you take a visit over to TIEPM.com. That's T I E pm.com and check out the investors and entrepreneurs professional mastermind.